Why do I feel like I linger? Linger between the words to say, eh? To say the words to remember. So guys, I'm a pretty big... I've been a fan since the ufotable adaptation of the Unlimited Blade Works route released. And I've been playing FGO on my phone for a couple of years now. I've also been a fan of Dark Souls and its franchise for about two or three years now, and I've always wondered how dropping a servant in a Soulsborne game would go. And so I've decided to run something of a simulation or a what-if situation to find out. To set some guidelines, first off, any servant that runs this what-if are treated as counter-guardians in that they are summoned by and serve the world, meaning no mana supply issues and no master to be killed. Also, if they are killed, the world can just summon them back, and without any hollowing. To frame this in a Dark Souls setting, if at any point they die, they can be resummoned at the closest bonfire. Also, as far as souls go, they can't be used to level up like the Chosen Undead can, but they can be used for additional power or as a mana substitute as per normal Fate Servants. Death still results in the loss of souls. Alright, with that said... Let's get into the first ever episode of... Pff, can this servant defeat Dark Souls? Alright, so barring any suggestions in the comments section, I'm probably just going to go in the order of the FGO servants list. That means we're starting with Mash Kyrielite, the Shielder Demi Servant, and, spoiler alert, a 10 second skip should suffice, the Human Host of Galahad. So, right now, We'll be going over her stats, and I'll discuss what they mean uh, as we officially start. So Mash has a C rank in Strength, an A rank in Endurance, a D in Agility, a B in Mana, and a C in Luck, and she has an unranked Noble Phantasm. So we'll start her off in the Cell, as we always do. Oscar is going to toss Mash the key to the cell and probably be shocked or confused by her lack of hollowing and by the fact that she is fully armored and has a massive shield. Regardless, Mash can now move forward. She would of course have to deal with some of the hollows whilst continuing forward, and while she likely wouldn't attack unprovoked, any hollow that would attack would be swiftly and easily put down. Now from here on, we'll discuss what would happen if Mash followed the course of the level that the game intends for you to take, and then I'll outline what would actually happen. After making her way through the weak hollows and finding Oscar, while it's not likely she'd have taken much damage at all, she would certainly take a bit of a scratch against the boulder trap. As she has an A in endurance and a D in agility, it's a lot more likely she goes for a block rather than a dodge. It's at this point she can either deflect it back up the stairs or to the side, or block it until it stops pushing. If she deflects it, let's just say she either sees Oscar through the bars upon entry into this area, or she hears him groan and busts the wall down either way. If she blocks it until it stops, she can just get pushed through the wall, taking negligible damage in the process anyway. Mash is then given direction by Oscar and moves to escape. She would then continue to work her way through the hollows until finally coming across our first boss, the Asylum Demon. Now I can address three things. This boss fight, what would actually happen as opposed to the route we just discussed, and what some of her FGO stats mean in terms of Dark Souls. In short, whether or not Mash chooses to fight the Asylum Demon in her first encounter or the second, she would win with no difficulty. After looking through some calculations on the internet and reviewing some feats and trying to find some consistency, to spare you all the boring mumbo jumbo, Mash is a little slower than pretty much every boss in the game, meaning she'll probably be okay to block attacks in most situations, but, true to form, she won't be doing much dodging, and multiple enemies might give her trouble. Now, the reason why she can deal with the Asylum Demon quite easily is from what I could find based on reviewing the strength of spells like the Chaos Storm spell and what dragons in the Dark Souls series can do, you know, considering Ornstein eats dragons for lunch, Mash should be about as strong as Smo and Ornstein, and she's probably comparable to every other boss in the game up to Gwyn, the final boss. Now there are some consistency errors here, and these bosses beyond the mid-game, and Orlando, could actually be massively stronger than her, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. 
For now, Mash essentially plows through the Asylum Demon with her first swing of a shield. Something crazy like that. She would then be free to walk to the cliff and be carried away to Firelink Shrine. After Mash gets dropped off, it's likely she'd chat with the man so depressed he flexes his depression for three games. After their little chat, she'll have her first target, the bells above. She may also happen across poor Anastasia and try to comfort her, or friendly Petrus and make a new friend, though I don't see her joining any covenants. After scouting around a bit and trying to figure out a way, whether you choose to chalk it up to her intelligence, her determination, or her C rank and luck, she would eventually make her way up to the undead bird, easily dispatching the hollows in her path. The ambushes may give her grief, but since servants can regenerate with mana or the souls she's gaining along the way, as a substitute or a means of regeneration separate from her contract to the world, and the hollows would be doing negligible damage to her even in many successful hits from spears, swords, arrows, or firebombs, she'd make it through the undead bird relatively unharmed. As she makes her way through, it's likely she'll come across a black knight, though they don't pose much of a threat to the equivalent of a mid-game chosen undead. So she's actually able to take it out with relative ease. Next, she makes her way up the stairs, blocking and destroying the flaming barrel and dispatching more hollows until she makes it to a seemingly destitute bridge where she is ambushed by two archer hollows. She makes quick work of them and moves on to be ambushed yet again by the Taurus Demon. Again, the Taurus Demon is a powerful foe, but none of its attacks are getting past her shield, and even if they do, it wouldn't do much damage enough to warrant even the use of her skills. Not only that, but she can pack a punch too. The Taurus Demon will quickly find that he's ambushed someone that would slap his ass. After turning the Taurus Demon into mince meat, she can move on to the Undead Parish where she'll continue to cleave her way through hollows, making a friend in Solaire along the way. She might be able to defeat the Hellkite Flamethrower on the bridge, but it can't do much in the way of damage to her, and while it's out of her normal range, she could potentially just jump up there and hit him good. In any case, Mash can move along and deal with the hollows and Iron Pig waiting nearby even possibly taking out another Black Knight along the way. After dealing with all the riffraff on the way over, Mash has gotten into the Church of the Bell, where she can meet Andre and make a new friend, as well as defeat an opponent that might be slightly difficult, the Titanite Demon. I don't expect Mash would have that tough of a time with it, but it would definitely be the hardest thing she's faced so far. After disposing of it, she can inspect the church, defeating many hollows inside, including the Thick Boy, with ease. She might also come across Lautrec, freeing him by destroying the door without a second thought because she's so kind. After all said and done, she would ascend the ladders to her first major boss fight, the Bell Gargoyles. Fighting one would be fairly simple, as they're still significantly weaker than her. However, as the second makes its entrance, Mash may begin to get overwhelmed. They already have a big range advantage on her due to their size, their weaponry being spears and tail axes, and their flame breath. Normally, with Mash's strength and durability advantage being so big, she would be able to compensate for the extended range of one opponent, but not only can her opponent fly to stay out of her range, but there are also two of them. This fight might be the first to require Mash to use a servant skill. As we progress through the campaign, we'll be giving Mash better stuff over time, such as her Spiritron dresses, uh, upgraded Servant skills, upgraded Noble Phantasms, and most importantly, more Noble Phantasm uses between bonfires. That's right, to prevent late game from being just her spamming her Noble Phantasms, I'm putting a cap on its use. Without dying, Noble Phantasms can only be used once per bonfire pass in early game, twice in mid game, and three times for endgame. That said, she wouldn't have to bust out any big guns here, so to speak. Yes, the range and numbers of enemies that are faster than her would give her trouble, but she's still immensely stronger and both would be at most at half health at this point. Mash would use Transient Wall of Snowflakes to give herself a 10-12% to defense boost, allowing her to tank all the attacks even better than before so she can 
wait for them to land from flight, move towards them and hit them while being hit herself, or even just walk through their flame breath and attack, all while taking minimum damage. After this, she'll easily be able to pick them off and win the fight. After that, Mash can finally ring her first bell of awakening. Now, for the bell below. After searching around and not seeing a way to progress downward, it's likely she'd either go down to the Dark Roots Basin, but we'll save that rabbit hole for when we get to it, uh, find one of her new besties, Sigmire, and promise to help him in return at Sen's Fortress, and or retrace her steps and find the Lower Undead Burg. Now, poison might be an issue for Mash to deal with, but since all servants have a natural strong resistance to poison, Mash will likely make it through her troubles okay. She'll save Griggs and defeat all the Hollows, Dogs, and Assassins in the area, uh, press forward to the powerful foe awaiting her, the Capra Demon. While Mash wouldn't know this yet, the Capra Demon has a key to the next zone she would need to go to, though she can just break her way through the barricades and doors like she's already done. So, she'll enter the Capra Demon's area, seeing the white mist door and knowing that there's an enemy behind it. She'll immediately be attacked by dogs and the demon himself. The Capra Demon and his accomplices will be swiftly dealt with, not presenting Mash with even a fourth of the challenge that the Gargoyles gave her. With this complete, she can now connect Firelink Shrine with the Undead Parish and move on to the Depths. Now, out of all the places Mash has been to so far, this place holds the greatest threat of death for her. Poison is dangerous to deal with despite her innate resistance, though basilisks with their curses and petrifications won't do much because of Mash's A-rank magic resistance. Which would be like having something crazy like a 100 in endurance to resist curse and petrification. Mash will deal with all the monsters in the area and even possibly rescue Laurentis. None of the enemies in this area, including the giant rat sub-boss, pose a threat beyond possible poison, and I'm happy to say that, with her C rank and luck, she's able to successfully navigate the area and find the boss room, though I don't think a C is high enough to have also found the bonfire in the area, so her last bonfire visit would have been to Firelink Shrine when she connected it to the Lower Undead Burg. Here she'll meet Domhnall, and make another friend, soon she'll have enough to make her own Chaldea. With things in place, she'll be met with an iron door or an open doorway. She decides to investigate the open doorway first and makes her way through. With a C rank in luck, I'd say she was lucky enough to have found and dealt with the channeler that can snipe you during the boss fight, but she'll still have to face her new opponent, the Gaping Dragon. Now, the Gaping Dragon isn't much stronger than the Bell Gargoyles in terms of standing within the game as a whole, but his range is much bigger due to his size and his tidal waves of acid, the latter of which might pose a decent threat to Mash. It is my opinion that this will be another fight in which Mash would need to use a skill to win, her Obscurant Wall of Chalk skill, which quite literally removes the target from the axis of time, which in layman's terms simply means she becomes invincible to anything in Dark Souls for a single instance. Now, cooldowns still apply, so she can't spam this either, but those power bombs of acid just became a lot less potent. She can take this instance of invulnerability to thrash the gaping dragon once unimpeded. Beyond this, with an A rank in endurance and a massive strength advantage, Mash should be able to power through any physical attacks and she'll just have to deal with any further acid attacks as they come. All in all, I think Mash would be able to make it out of this with more than enough health and stamina not to have to dip hard into her steadily and quickly growing reserves of souls in order to push onward. She can now return to the Iron Doors and push on to... Blight Town. So guys, I'll be honest with you. Mash dies here. Not before she can reach the first bonfire, so there's something, but regardless, Mash does gain her first death in this shithole of a place. Based on her not having any resistance to poisons beyond her baseline servant resistance, and her only having a D in agility and a C in luck, I'd say it's fair to say Mash dies a total of you know, something like eight times before making it to the next bonfire, which she would find, but it would be a bit difficult as 
She's not looking for it, she doesn't know it's there, and only has a C in luck. If she had a D or lower, I wouldn't say she'd find it at all. She would die maybe five times to falling to her death in several locations, maybe once from the poison of the swamp racking up on her, and at least twice to the Toxin Dart Squad. Regardless, after getting a hang of the dying and coming back aspect of being a counterforce guardian, and that she can come back at the bonfires, the footing and ledges of Blighttown, the poison of the swamp, and the toxin darts, she'll find reprieve in the Blighttown floor bonfire. None of the enemies in this area are too strong to defeat, by the way. So, Mash then searches around, being careful about those fucking mosquitoes and spider things and the poisons and the rock throwers and the... and the... Ugh, I hate Blight Town. Anyway, Mash will eventually find her way to the exit of Blight Town, not dying once in the process. After realizing this is the way out and remembering the bell below is still here and unrung, she'll search the floor and find the Great Hollow entrance, but she'll be fooled by the illusion the first time around. She would then finally find the elusive layer of Quellag. Now Quellag is actually fairly strong, much stronger than anything in the game so far by a considerable degree, but she still isn't quite on the level of a mid-game boss or enemy. The only thing she might have to fear is the lava, but when she uses her honorable wall of snowflake skill to give a big boost in her defense, it's likely she'll be taking just as much damage from this significantly stronger boss as she did with peon bosses like the Asylum Demon. At this point, she can destroy Quellag and ring the last bell of awakening. Alright, so it's likely that Mash will begin to wander, looking for where to go next as, unlike the Chosen Undead, Mash can't see the cutscene to know that Sens has opened up. I'm pretty much going to chalk up all of a servant finding something as either C or higher rank luck, or intelligence or some shit. So I suppose it's going to be fun to see how a D or lower rank luck berserker or something runs its way through this. Anyway, she'll eventually figure out about Sens. This might be difficult for poor Mash, as she can defend against enemies like Snake Men, and she can defend against traps like all the hidden arrow traps and the like, but ultimately the guillotine traps will probably give her the most trouble. With little footing on the bridges to get a good holding for defense, and she's more likely to get knocked off the bridge than getting sliced. I'm sure she'd fall at least four times until she made it through to the first boulder section, and I, and I also don't believe any of these falls would kill her. Sure, the fall would be rough, and the many Titanite demons will be a pain in the ass, but she's still stronger than them by a fair amount, so at worst she might need to activate a transient or honorable wall of snowflakes. Maybe even an obscurant wall of chalk for a second of invulnerability, but she should be fine regardless. Once the boulder section comes around, I don't believe she'll be making it to the top room, but due either to her D in agility or her C in luck, I do expect her to dodge to find good old Sigmire. After a good chat and taking care of the rubbish in the area, Mash can give it another try and use her shield to redirect the boulder, allowing her to make it to the next section. Mash would then go on through all the traps and enemies to the next boulder section. This one, she's just going to have to take. She can block to mitigate damage, but exiting out of the game and coming back to reset the boulder isn't an option for Mash. It'll hurt, but she'll be just fine. After that, I can see Mash using the device to send a boulder down each path, save for the one Siegmire is trying to get up, what with them being friends and all. After this, we can have Mash save Big Hat Logan, with this one being contributed more so to curiosity rather than luck, as I expect she'll check out each path, discovering Logan in one, the hole to the outside castle, and Siegmire's path, with the fourth path of course being the one she had just come from. She would continue onward, being able to make her way through the rest of the snake men, the hidden arrow traps, and the guillotines until she makes her way to the giant bomb area. The bombs won't be much of an issue for a beef girl like Mash, so she's free to roam around as long as she blocks frequently. She can get the new bonfire, she can take care of the big boy, she can take out Ricard, she can do it all. 
After that, she can set the elevator system up and continue onward to defeat the Spoil Sport Bomb Thrower for the boss fight. He's a bit hard to miss, especially if you have a C rank in luck and a proclivity to explore anyway. He's really not going to be too big of an issue, but in order to avoid dipping too far into her soul reserves, she'll use Transient Wall of Snowflakes to avoid some unwanted damage. Remember, she's likely lost all of her souls in Blight Town, with a lot of her different deaths, especially the Falling Deaths. So with that taken care of, time to take on the Iron Golem. Now, I don't know if anyone was expecting this per se, but this boss, while not technically mid-game quite yet, is the first boss that's either as strong as or quite a bit stronger than M.A.S.H. Basically, the dragons are the key. Because of the artifact they created that caused a massive storm at Arch Dragon's Peak, they would come out to be either exactly as strong as or over five times stronger than M.A.S.H. Since the core of the Iron Golem is made from dragon scales, he's probably at least comparable to the dragons, since it's quite literally his power source. We'll be using an average of this, saying that the enemies will be at most three times stronger, which is still likely to prove difficult. Either way, she'll be going into this fight with full health, with plenty of souls left over, one of her noble phantasms as a use, which is currently Lord Chaldea. As per the rules set to the limit noble phantasms, as outlined prior, and all of her skills will be at the ready. The fight is likely to start as it always does. One of the Iron Golem's blasts comes straight from M.A.S.H. This will give M.A.S.H. an opportunity to find out just how much stronger the new enemy is without immediately getting overwhelmed, as it is a single hit from far away, and it takes a while to fire off another one. After blocking but still being hurt pretty badly, M.A.S.H. is going to immediately up the ante, Honorable Wall of Snowflakes, and go on the attack. Now, since Honorable gives a 15-17% to 17 defense boost and a fairly sizable damage cut, which we'll basically present in this what-if scenario as subtracting damage from the total, so the attack hits, a portion of the damage is subtracted and completely negated, the defense decreases the remaining damage, and then the damage is dealt. Now, the Iron Golem and Mash can take the same amount of damage, though Mash still can't deal as much damage as either her or the Iron Golem can take. It'll be a long process for Mash to defeat the Iron Golem due to her being weaker, but she can take the hits well enough to eventually get the job done. Normally Iron Golem would kill Mash because they can both take the same amount of damage, but Iron Golem deals more damage. Simply put, Mash's answer to this is to use Obscurant Wall of Chalk as a trump card, but more importantly, her Lord Chaldea Noble Phantasm. While none of Mash's buffs last long, all of them last at most three enemy attacks. For three hits, Iron Golem will be doing about half the damage he was doing before, so about the same as if an exact clone of Mash were to hit Mash. For one hit, Iron Golem literally does nothing, and upon activation of Lord Chaldea, Mash gains a barrier for three hits that negates half as much damage as the Obscurant Wall of Chalk, but gives her a 30-50% to 50 defense increase. At this point, Iron Golem would barely be doing any damage to Mash, and if it should attempt one of those Wind Slice attacks, Lord Chaldea might even reflect it back like Lord Chaldea did against Saber Alter's Excalibur Morgana Blast. Basically, the fight would be over in around... 15 to 20 hits, if even that, meaning it would take Mash at most 60 hits to win, but 20 to die. However, if 7 of those hits are weakened, it becomes a lot more possible, especially due to the damage cut that just outright lull nopes a portion of the damage. If you were to say she dies here around, I don't know, 4 or 5 times, I wouldn't blame you. But personally, the way I see it is, at least by the fifth attempt, I think she'd be able to figure out the Iron Golem's attack pattern, optimal blockage time, and how to effectively manage her skill usage, as well as when to use her Noble Phantasm. I personally move forward with the line of thinking that she'll win on her second try, giving old Mash the benefit of the doubt. After this, she can be carried on to Anorlando after examining the Iron Golem's Golden Turd.
While Mash has received a mini bonus and a skill upgrade, Transient Wall of Snowflakes to Honorable Wall of Snowflakes, after the Quillag fight to celebrate the ringing of both Bells of Awakening, if she defeats Smo and Ornstein, the upcoming boss fights and likely one of her toughest fights, she'll gain her first big upgrade, her Spiritron dress and two Noble Phantasm uses per bonfire visit. So, Mash will be dropped into Anne Orlando, and seeing as there's really only one way to go, that's what she'll do. She'll avoid the Sentinels she can and deal with the ones she has to, and she'll eventually make her way to the Dark Moon Nidus, who she'll try to become friends with, with varying degrees of success, but more importantly, Nidus will give Mash her new mission. As she heads towards the main castle, she'll encounter some strong gargoyles and some painting guardians, but nothing she can't handle with an obscure wall of chalk or two. After that, she'll be completing the bridge and moving right along. Afterwards, she'll have to deal with more Sentinels and those Batwing Demons. I don't see any of that being particularly difficult, but the Silver Knights, particularly the Archers of Anorlando, could present some difficulty. They're easy enough to deal with up close, but when firing at you while you attempt to scale the narrow passages of Anorlando, they present a great threat. I actually don't believe Mash will die here as she can just block the arrows and scale with her D-rank agility, still being fast and agile enough to scale the ledges in no time. After entering the castle, Mash can rest at the bonfire and chat with a fellow adventuring friend, Solaire, while she takes a second to recuperate mentally, if not physically. She then continues her conquest against the Silver Knights, Mimics, and Titanite Demons, helping her other close friend, Siegmeier, out of a predicament along the way. I bet these friendly fellow adventurers along the way are a great comfort to Mash. In any case, Mash will continue beyond the final staircase for this area, into the Great Hall. Now, Mash can make a new friend in the giant blacksmith, open the front entrance, and combat the two royal sentinels as well as the archer of An Orlando. At this point, Mash hasn't been back to Firelink Shrine, so if and when she does return to find Anastasia dead, only then can she return to fight Lautric the traitor. For now, Mash must face a great foe, and another great foe, uh, two great foes. Whatever, she's got to fight Smo and Ornstein. <laughs> so upon entry, she'll see she's being combated by two different individuals, and very early in the fight, she'll be able to tell their general styles, slow and hard and quick and light. I believe that, due to her being three times weaker, quite a bit slower, and inexperienced in general combat, especially against two knights with thousands of years of experience fighting against the likes of dragons and men alike, she's going to have a hard time. I'd say Mash loses this a bare minimum of six times, making mistakes like trying to fight both at the same time, getting cornered, not being spatially aware enough getting shocked by one knight absorbing the other and dropping her guard, not properly adapting to Super Smo and or not adapting properly to Super Ornstein, amongst other possible mistakes here. Of which she can basically make none, as they take pretty big chunks off of her large health pool, so to speak, but she doesn't do that much damage to them, killing the likes of Ornstein, the less beefy of the two, in something like 60 clean hits. Eventually, Mash would learn to divide and conquer, and that she needs to consider the limits of Noble Phantasm uses, as well as the cooldown on her skills. Her first priority should be Ornstein. His range advantage isn't much less than Smo with melee, as Smo is almost twice Ornstein's size, but Ornstein has a spear where, where Smo only has a hammer. Ornstein has ranged lightning attacks. Ornstein is much faster, recognizing that defense against hard hits is literally her main shtick, but dealing with somebody considered fast in a world of people slightly faster than her is not. And Ornstein is a better fighter overall, an executioner slash Knight of Gwyn reject versus the captain of the Knights of Gwyn. The plan of action is as follows. Since Smo is actually faster than her, but true to the normal game, he's also bigger and clunkier than her, she can circle around Smo while combating Ornstein, making the turn radius just large enough that he can't just walk up to her, forcing him to have to continuously turn to attack her, but just far enough away that quick turn swings and AoE butt stomps can't reach her. 
Against Ornstein, she starts the fight with three turns of Honorable Wall of Snowflakes, which cuts damage and adds defense. With the defense alone, Ornstein would have to hit her a minimum of 20 times to kill her, so with the damage cut also present, it'd be closer to 25 to 30. Mash still has to hit Ornstein at least 45 times, at most 60 times, so he definitely has an advantage, and that buff only lasts for three turns. However, adding to this her obscurant wall of chalk turns she can muster, killing Ornstein becomes extremely doable. However, that leads to the tricky part. Mash must now fight Super Smo while heavily damaged and with a low supply of souls due to her 5 to 10 times, 6 in my opinion, deaths and potential failure to recover said souls. With all of her skills likely on cooldown or about to be used and then put on cooldown, this would be the perfect time for her to use her Noble Phantasm. The great thing about her Noble Phantasm, Lord Chaldea currently, is that it makes her defense higher than any other enemy in Dark Souls save for Lord Gwyn himself. She may have to hit them a lot, but Super Smo is going to be doing less damage to her than he would the Four Kings or even Grave Lord Nito for the next three turns. Even better yet, as with Iron Golem's Wind Slash or Saber Altar's Excalibur Morgana, if Mash baits a lightning ass blast, she could not only take minuscule damage in general, but she might even be able to reflect the lightning blast back at Smo for way more damage than she's currently dealing. All in all, if somebody told me they thought Mash, even in the best case scenario, would still lose considering the damage taken so far and the lack of a real and viable way to heal, coupled with the lack of enough offensive power, I wouldn't blame them or think they're wrong. However, I'm willing to say, with her servant skills, her noble phantasm, and her experience fighting these guys several times at this point, she can and would in fact defeat them. As an official reward for her entrance into mid-game, Mash can now use her noble phantasm, Mold Camelot, twice per bonfire pass, as well as her Spiritron dress, and all of its other amenities. Mash is now the proud owner of the Ortonex and all of its servant skills. With this, Mash can meet the bountifully chested, chestily gifted Guinevere, daughter of Gwyn, completely unaware of Gwendolyn's behind-the-scenes involvement and machinations. Or if she was aware, the fact of the matter would still be that she wants to save the world regardless of the politics. And she'd probably even see Gwendolyn as good, as he seems to desire the safety of the world as well. Hence what the illusion of Guinevere says. With that, Mash can take the Lord's Vessel back to the Firelink Shrine. Mash will discover several things upon returning to Firelink Shrine. 1. Anastasia is dead, and a strange item wants her to go to Anne Orlando once more. 2. All of her friends, like Logan, Siegmeier, etc., are all here. And 3. There's a big ugly worm thing in Firelink now. After speaking with all of her friends, sending Siegmeier to Blighttown and Logan to Seath's place shortly, amongst other friends going elsewhere, Mash will speak with Frampt and learn of her final quest before facing the Lord of Cinders. She must face off against the Great Lords to get their souls, opening the way to the Kiln of the First Flame. She accepts this quest, but first follows up with a few friends. Unfortunately, though Mash will likely never find this out, while Griggs is fine and safe at Firelink now, he'll eventually leave to Sen's fortress and perish. For now, there is nothing she needs to do but enjoy his company. The most pressing matter is the strange item beckoning to her to Anne Orlando, found on the corpse of Anastasia. Upon arriving at Anne Orlando and combating the returned enemies, Mask is whisked away to another world once entering the Great Hall where she will be met by none other than Lautrec, her old friend. She's able to figure out that he must have been the one to kill Anastasia and take her soul. She begs and pleads with him to give up the soul, but Lautrec calls her a weak fool and proclaims that he and his boys will enjoy taking whatever souls and humanity she might have. She attempts to defend against the onslaught of the three men, 
but with Lautrec and his companions being in the realm of strength as the Iron Golem and Smo and Ornstein, Mash is at a serious disadvantage. Mash uses her intellect to devise a plan that involves her getting the soul without killing Lautrec. By using one of her new servant skills, Tragic Shield of Rousel, she can both force all three men to target her and attack, making specifically Lautrec get closer to attack her, and it gives her invulnerability. When Lautrec attacks, she can take the hit without defending to take the soul from him. Unfortunately, as Lautrec is soon to smugly inform her, she can't leave without killing him specifically. While he crudely laughs, Mash, seeing no other option, will make her play to kill the villainous traitor Lautrec. Mash, with her Ortonex dress, now finally has a way to boost her offense in the form of the Bunker Bolt, which boosts her damage and critical hit chance considerably. With this, she can take a couple of hits with no damage by using the Tragic Shield of Rousing, and she can deal some strong damage with the Bunker Bolt. If she does what she sets out to do and only kills Lautrec, she can actually do this on the first try. Killing the others would be out of character and a waste of time. Having avenged Anastasia and returning to the original world, Mash can now return to Firelink Shrine and revive Anastasia, become fast friends, or as fast as friends as Anastasia will let her become. Laurentius would never end up going hollow, as Mash knows no spells, particularly no pyromancy, so she would have never seen Qualana, so no Qualana spells, no reason for Laurentius to go to Blighttown and die. So happily, Laurentius will continue on as Mash's friend. Of course, Crestfallen Warrior is going to be bitching about Framp's nasty ass until it's time to send his ass to Dark Souls 2, but for now, we can move on to the next NPC quest. Mash will look around for an absent friend not at the shrine, Solaire, and eventually find him at the Sunlight Altar. Mash will be concerned about what she hears, but ultimately, she'll try to cheer Solaire up and go. Mash, upon returning to Firelink, will meet and befriend Patrice's new friends, Rhea, Vince, and Nico. They seem nice if not a little single-minded, but now it's time for Mash to undertake one of her more difficult NPC quests, keeping up with our Onion Boy. The last time we'll be seeing him for a while is in Blight Town, where Mash will have to get some purple moss for her friend. After procuring it for him and getting it to him, they'll both be along their merry way. Mash might at this point get curious about that dead end from before. Seems a bit odd that a tree root that big would just lead to one medium-sized room. And now that she's not distracted with finding Quellag, she can take advantage to investigate eventually figuring out that it's an illusion, working her way through the Great Hollow. Not wanting to continue on this path without reason, she'll make a mental note to come back another time. After so Mash much is a pretty good idea of mission where to start and friend. quest for the Lord Souls. First stop, the Catacombs. Now all the skeletons Mash will deal with will go down and stay down, as of course, her shield is a magical weapon. She'll make her way through, killing the skellies, blocking the exploding heads, taking down the necromancers, and activating that bonfire and switch. Mainly, she'll just work her way through the spooky scary skeletons down here, avoiding the traps, and throwing switches and levers in the process. Really nothing to note. For those of you wondering, however, she'll miss the hidden bonfire. There's a chance while down here for her to run into a black knight. If she does, she'll make short work of it and move on to the skeleton wheels. She'll find a new friend in Vamos the Blacksmith. While her friendship will likely be unwanted, she'll consider him a friend no less and move on afterwards to the Pinwheel boss fight. Now while Pinwheel's kit makes him seem intimidating, well with his quick fireball, his cleansing fireball, his flamethrower spell, the clones he can set up, and his ability to seemingly vanish into thin air. He's really not that big of a deal. Pinwheel is not only one of the most fragile bosses in the Dark Souls series, but he's only as strong as an early game boss, meaning Mash will be able to wipe him out easily. To hit the important notes for each of the final dungeons, starting with, of course, the Tomb of Giants, 
Nothing of note really happens with all the big bony boys, save for the Patches encounter which Mash forgives and befriends him, the Rhea encounter in which she mercy kills her new friends and saves Rhea, and the final room with all the Walmart brand pinwheels and the murder death babies. I can see the murder death babies cutting into Mash's health and soul pool, and a curse would definitely be an issue, but I don't see Mash getting cursed here, and she'll be able to handle the pinwheels decently with her uber defense. Now, we arrive at the first lord, Grave Lord Nido. Now, Nido is still one of the characters that's only roughly three times Mash in strength and durability, but Nido... But Nido's built different. Nido has his miasma that's a smog of poison, disease, and death. Now Mash has a decent resistance against some of those things, but if Mash plays her usual style of trading blows and blocking, she's sure to die. Now that's something Mash is going to have to learn. The hard way. On the one hand, I'm sure Mash would figure out the properties of the smog early on. However, I think the potency and having to adapt her fighting style so heavily will be a huge issue. I think this will be one of Mash's hardest fights in the whole game. And I think, considering disease, poison, and death are all ailments that bypass or ignore defense and durability, that Mash would die no less than 9 times in trying to figure out how to kill Wolnir 1.0. Eventually, she'll start to work with his pattern, playing more similarly to what you'd expect to see from the Chosen Undead. She'd start, of course, by boosting her critical attack chance and her buster attacks, which the Dark Souls equivalent would be, I guess, heavy attacks, I suppose. Gravelord's sword attacks can be blocked and parried for potential reposts. Gravelord greatsword dances are some of the most dangerous attacks to deal with, meaning if she attempts to distance herself from Nido to avoid miasma or to clear out ads getting in the way, like the bony boys, she must always keep one eye on the ground for both Nido sticking his sword into the ground and the onset signs of a sword coming out of the ground. The attack is so dangerous because it's difficult to block that just coming out of the ground beneath you and it causes poison damage which would hurt regardless of any defense buffs save for maybe obscure and wall of chalk. The number one threat to fight against is Nido's Miasma. It can't be blocked in the traditional sense and it'll cause the most overall damage out of everything. Finally, the second easiest thing to deal with, with the Great Lord's Sword attacks being the easiest, the Death Grip is normally something annoying to deal with, but Mash, after roughly 10 tries, should by now know to make herself scarce when she sees any glowing red hands. As to how Mash should deal with Nido, her best chance is to spam Bunker Bolt as much as possible for maximum damage. Spam use Tragic Shield of Rousal as sparingly as possible but whenever necessary, as it grants invulnerability, allowing Mash to take no damage from attacks with swords or Nido's hand, with her only concern being getting poisoned, cursed, petrified, etc. while invulnerable. But Tragic Shield also decreases her health with each use. If she's careful, she can use Bunker Bolt in conjunction with Tragic Shield to take no damage from Nido's hits and unload lots of damage. Finally, for worst case scenario, she has two uses of Molt Camelot, which provides a 30-50% to 50 defensive boost and cuts damage for five separate attacks at most, three hits at least. Despite Molt Camelot being an off-brand Lord Camelot, it's been stated as being strong enough to block Divine Spirit attacks, for that reason that, with the defensive buffs gained from Mold Camelot, Mash's defense is boosted to a similar level as Gwyn for its duration. Surprising, I know, but considering what we've seen of Mold and what we know of Gwyn, it actually makes sense. Artemis in Fate, a Greek god and Divine Spirit, has been shown to be able to control, create, and destroy stars, and that much has been stated numerous times, what with her apparently having full control over stars as a god, and even creating the Orion constellation herself. Ivan the Terrible in Fate, during Lost Belt 1, was stated as being able to defeat Zeus, a superior god to Artemis, 
If that's the case, then it's likely that Zeus has the strength to generate or destroy a star as a superior god to Artemis. So Ivan, who in turn is stronger than Zeus, should be able to do such things as well. Mold Camelot blocked an attack from Ivan, so while Lord Chaldea was stronger than everything in the game save for Lord Gwyn, by whom it's severely outclassed, Mold Camelot is actually about as strong as him, with Gwyn quite literally powering the sun, hence his moniker, Lord of Sunlight. So Nito will barely be doing any damage for a total of a minimum of 6 hits. Since unlike Smo and Ornstein, there's no part 2 to the fight, the cooldown of Servant Skills and Noble Phantasm uses won't be as much a factor. After learning to play by the patterns and managing her cooldowns and uses properly while avoiding curses and poison, Mash can and will defeat her first great lord, Grave Lord Nido. Next up is the Duke's Archives. Knowing of its location due to her having discussed with the Dark Moon Nidus, Mash will head for the Duke's Archives. Nothing of particular note happens on her way to the Crystal Cave, with the exception of her initial death to Seath, as he's still invulnerable in his encounter due to the primordial crystal still being intact. She would of course be resummoned within the cell by the counterforce, placing her even closer to her goal. Once she manages an escape, she'll help Big Hat Logan, free the Naga girls, and mercy kill those that try to kill her. Later on in, she will free Siglina and befriend her as well, resuming Sigmire's quest. Now to the Crystal Cave. Navigation of the cave may prove difficult, especially with the invisible paths, but I believe that while she may die once or twice to the invisible paths, steep sloped crystal paths, or monsters knocking her off, she'll have died no more than three times. Though she will be doing the Seath fight with no heals, so to speak. While I suppose I'd be fine with anyone thinking Mash may die, like, once here, the Primordial Crystal gimmick is kinda easy to spot, and while his curse can still affect her through her A-rank magic resistance, it's nowhere near as potent as Nito's, so she should be okay as long as she plays it safe. His invulnerability may get her killed, but not only is it obvious based on its position to the boss room and the fact that Seath comes to kill Mash when she gets near it to inspect it that the crystal is important to Seath, but he's fairly likely to destroy it himself by accident, even more so with Mash's C-rank luck. Worst case scenario, Mash dies to being hit, with a cursed death being unlikely, but sees Seath is healing, figures out it's the crystal, destroys it, and works from there. Again, the best way of going about this is, would be to spam Bunker Bolt as much as possible, though managing health with Tragic Shield risk and reward isn't necessary here, as her two Mold Camelots will negate most of Seath's damage, and his curse is only strong enough to kill Mash if she's stupid, which she is not. All in all, considering the speed gap not being as big as, say, Mash and Ornstein, Seath's limited range of motion and generally slow movements Mash might be able to kill Seath with relative ease, seeing as she'd still only have to hit Seath at most 60 times without even using heavy attacks and without the Bunker Bolt buff. Bunker Bolt buff. Bunker Bolt buff. Bunker Bolt buff. Bruh. Bah. Bah. Mash should defeat Seath with mm, medium difficulty, I guess. Moving on to the Four Kings. It'll be at this point that Mash, unfortunately, has to send the Crestfallen Warrior to Hell, also known as Dark Souls 2. After that, Mash would be able to work her way through New Londo with marginal difficulty. After finding and befriending Ingward, she'll receive the key to the seal to get to the Abyss, but be informed that she must get the Covenant of Artorias to get the Lord's Soul. She'll eventually find herself in the Darkroot Garden, having spoken to Andre of Astora and gaining the Seal of Artorias. She enters and makes her way to Sif, evading and avoiding the covenant of PvP scrubs in the forest. Once she makes it through, she'll be accosted by and having to sadly put down our good boy. Sif is a tough fight, likely being as strong as a Knight of Gwyn. This will definitely involve a lot of straight defense, as Mash can't keep up with Sith's constant movement. 
She'll just use Bunker Bolt for offense and use two of Mold Camelot for defense, with Tragic Shield only needing to be used if Sif still hasn't died at that point, with no deaths needed here. Mash will recover the Covenant of Artorias, continuing through New Londos, Spirits, and Dark Wraiths, eventually making her way to the Abyss. She'll slip on the ring and dive in. This will likely be the easiest lord to face as Mash is basically a mid-game Havel, with the Havel we have in Dark Souls 1 being early game. Mash will Omega Havel monster this fight and easily win. Now we've got three boss fights in the next zone and we're pretty much starting with a boss fight. First we've got a big ugly to deal with, Mr. Unrelenting Splooge. The Ceaseless Discharge, much like Quillag, is stronger than early game bosses by quite the measure, but he still doesn't compare to mid game bosses, so he'll be dispatched easily without even using the cheesy strat. Afterwards, Mash has some demons to deal with a, a group of Tauruses, some Capra, and several of those fucking worm demons along the stone path and the, the ground beyond the staircase. After dealing with that, we're on to our next boss fight already. The Fire Sage Demon. This boss shouldn't be too difficult, as she's already familiar with its attack pattern to a degree. Same old strategy of Bunker Bolt and Tragic Shield should be enough, as I don't think the heat of the Fire Sage would be too much to block. Besides, blocking with a Magical Shield is one of the optimum strats for this boss anyway. After taking care of the Fire Sage, unfortunately, since Mash did not help Solaire with his new hat problem, she would have to mercy kill another friend, and a dear friend at that. This is definitely the big sad. Don't worry, it gets worse, because now Mash has to deal with the centipede demon alone. Now, it shouldn't present difficulty more than a great lord of which Mash has taken on three and one, but this would be one of the few bosses that requires a noble phantasm use, despite not really being a unique person like Smo or a lord or something. Due to the damage she's likely going to take from getting knocked into lava, she's going to need some Tragic Shield of Rousings. She's going to need both Mold Camelots, and she's definitely going to need Bunker Bolt. The quicker she gets this over with, the better. Not to say she'll die here, but it'll be an annoying and tough fight. After this, she can work her way through the fucking lava hellscape that waits her after this fight. Damn, this last little stint in the demon ruins fucking sucks. Unless you join a covenant and sacrifice 30 humanity, you have to kill one of your best friends, fight an annoying boss that knocks you into lava, and then wade through lava past a bunch of huge monster demons. Eh, forget this place, Mash is going to Lost Isolith. So the Chaos Statues and the Chaos Eaters won't be an issue for Mash, so she can just stroll on by. I suppose the Witch of Isolith would give her a bit of an issue, though nothing really worth going over. The two most important things here are Siegmire and a Lord Soul. Now I will say this, the Siegmire section will be cake. Mash rolls up, gets the lowdown from Siegmire, jumps into that bitch and uses the Amalgam Goad and Tragic Shield of Rousing to force the Chaos Eaters to target Mash, so even if Siegmire jumps down there, he won't be able to get so much as hit, allowing for the quest to be set for completion in the best way. Next, we move on to one of the fucking stupidest bosses in Dark Souls, the Bed of Chaos. So this is a pretty simple boss, but its gimmick fucking sucks. As per what we see with the Chosen Undead, Mash won't be able to hurt the Bed of Chaos, so she must kill the nasty little Chaos Bugs. The Double Swipe attack can be blocked, so there's not much of an issue there. Mash can block the Double Swipe Bed of Chaos, is sure to attempt upon entry, but as Mash approaches one of the bugs she's undoubtedly noticed, as they practically scream weakness after combating the bed to no avail, fending off against double swipes all the while. Bed would use a root slam, destroying the floor beneath Mash, and she would die regardless of blocking as she isn't fast enough to avoid the fall to her death. Upon returning, she would again go for one of the bugs that she was going for, or the other one she hasn't gone for. 
but if she goes for the bug that was blocked prior, she'll be slowed down by a massive hole in the ground, getting hit with double fire pick, the two scythe attacks. Mash could block the attack and use a skill to boost her defense to make it to the bug, but even with the defense boost, taking too many double hits with additional fire damage is not a good thing. Upon seeing the success of that, she'd move to the second bug, and die to the root slam again. Knowing it's coming doesn't do much, as even if you wanted to avoid it, you'd get knocked into it by those stupid double swipes. After entering, again, she'll make her way over to the second bug, but get hit with a chaos firestorm on her way over. Luckily, she would see the fire and lava building up and bubbling under her feet before it basically blows her up and risks another fall, so she could use the Tragic Shield of Rousing skill and make it to the second bug, destroying it upon arrival. Now she can go after the final bug, and actually narrowly avoids falling to her death as the middle section in front of the bed gives way only to die when Bed uses Flame Aura while Mash is jumping for the Root Bridge, engulfing her in Flames of Chaos and knocking her down the hole. <sighs> One last time, Mash enters. She activates Mold Camelot, takes any hits while running, uses Tragic Shield as she jumps, making it regardless of attacks used, gets to the Chaos Bug, and defeats her fourth and final Lord. She is now ready to take on Gwyn. To wrap up business with NPCs before finishing this fight, we'll check on our remaining friends. Laurentis is still chillin'? Unfortunately, it would seem Petrus killed Rhea to prevent her from going hollow. Nash understands. Also, Siglina is here with news of her reunion with her father, but also with foreboding of his death. Other than those changes, everyone else is gone leaving Mash to find out what's happened to her final dear old friend. Upon eventually working her way through the Great Hollow and finding the Ash Lake, she'll see that she has lost another of her close dear friends, but acknowledges that he's at peace now. After comforting Siglina, Mash now has the conviction to complete the quest she started so long ago. It's time. Mash blows through the Black Knights, having returned to her normal servant skill set and having upgraded from two Mold Camelots to three Lord Camelots. Alright, so Mash can walk through and take on Lord Gwyn. Unfortunately, Gwyn is so much stronger than Mash that he would literally kill her in a single hit. Gwyn is astronomically stronger than anything Mash has faced thus far, and is one of the strongest characters in the whole Dark Souls series, only second to the Lord of Cinder and the, and the Ashen One who defeated it in his prime, with even the Chosen Undead not being as strong as his prime by the end of the game. Mash will die... so many times. Mash will die at least 80 to 100 times. The gap is truly insane, with it taking Mash a little over 120 quintillion normal hits to defeat Gwyn. Based off of power scaling? No, Mash could never, ever beat Gwyn. However, if we look into it in terms of game stats, Gwyn has a little over 4000 HP and can take out about a fifth of an average Chosen Undead's hit points per hit. We'll say that Mash is essentially the average build, normally leveled Chosen Undead. So she can die in 5 hits, but it'll take about 40 normal hits to kill Gwyn. Mash can start with the Honorable Wall of Snowflakes to reduce 5 hits to 8 for 3 different attacks in a row. And she can also pop up her first Lord Camelot, which reduces 8 hits to 13 hits for those 3 turns. And she'll eventually... And she even gets an attack boost, cutting 40 hits to kill Gwyn down to 28. Gwyn would likely open with a dashing thrust, only for it to do so much less damage than the insane god was expecting. Mash then comes in and packs a fairly decent punch, despite her weapon of choice being a shield. Gwyn would then attempt a counter in his quad-slash combo, trying to rack up damage on his well-defended foe. 
This won't do much, as MASH is still over 10 hits away from death. Normally it would be 8 hits away, however MASH has blocked all the attacks, significantly reducing their impact. MASH can then return to the offensive, taking Gwyn's overall health pool down even more. To cripple his defensive foe, Gwyn performs a kick on MASH while she's blocking, knocking the wind out of her and making it difficult to keep the shield raised. MASH belts off some more damage, but her buffs are gone, with Honorable Wall of Snowflakes being gone for five more of these back and forths. She sets up another Lord Camelot, but even though she has regained a total of nine possible hits until death, she's already taken about a third of that and can't muster the strength to defend herself. Gwyn attempts to capitalize on this situation to its fullest. Lower buffs and defenseless means Gwyn can use the slash and thrust, getting off two hits and stunning Mash for his slashing uppercut combo, which consists of three hits, the first of which has a similar effect to that of the kick, leaving her defenseless again with just one hit of life left. She'd be doomed. If not for her obscurant wall of chalk, but she can make herself invulnerable to his slash and thrust attack, meaning she's not stunned. She can go on the offensive again, leaving dear old Gwyn with nearly 20 hits left until he dies. Gwyn would use the slashing upper combo, leaving Mash defenseless with four hits of life left. Luckily, Mash has one more attack's worth of Lord Camelot, at which she can use Honorable Wall of Snowflakes and her last Lord Camelot in conjunction once more. Gwyn uses the double slash, yes I realize he could kill her here with that 4 hit combo attack, fuck off, this is fun, let me do my thang, leaving Nash with just 2 hits left. Nash keeps up with the shield bashes and bonks, gaining her buffs once more in Lord Camelot and Honorable Wall of Snowflakes, now having 6 hits of hit points left. Gwyn wants to end this soon, as he draws closer as she draws closer to no Noble Phantasm uses and being on cooldown, though technically who wouldn't know this? Gwyn uses Charging Slash to break Mash's guard. Again finding herself unable to muster a guard, she attacks while she can, bringing Gwyn just shy of 20 hits till he's dead. Gwyn takes this opportunity to use his Quad Slash combo, leaving Mash with a pitiful 2 hits. MASH makes the executive decision to use the 72,600 souls she currently has to give herself 7 hits back. The first time she's ever truly been in such a dire situation, she's needed a mass heal, a testament to Gwyn's power. Gwyn uses his onslaught with his strongest single hit move, the explosive hand. MASH is caught through her block and is knocked down to 5 hit points. She uses her final turn with her attack boost to deal as much damage as she can. Now having to solely rely on her personal skills and class skills, Mash fights a fierce battle. She has to be weary of attacks that take her stamina away or persist through her block. With her possession inheritance skill, the closer she gets to defeating Gwyn, the stronger her defense gets, as it's tied to her willpower. Beyond this, she must rely on her walls with three hits of life left after Lord Camelot and Honorable Wall of Snowflakes wears off. She feels the weight of the world on her shoulders in this fight, and realizes that she's defending the world against destruction. She feels the power flow through her as her self-field defense grows insanely strong as Mash attempts to shield the world from harm. Yes, I understand that's not actually how it works, just go with it. Mash is able to block, parry, and counter everything Gwyn throws at her, and eventually, she defeats him. Having won the hardest fight she's ever fought, and having completed this insane journey, she steals herself once more, as she did in the Temple of Solomon, to sacrifice herself. She rekindles the flame, and her sacrifice saved the world. For now. Thank you guys so much for watching. Leave a like on this video if you enjoyed this and want me to make more of these types of videos. Subscribe if you want to get notified of when those videos or other videos I make release. Comment down below on what you guys want to see from this channel. I have some ideas, but nothing's set in stone. I'm thinking about doing Altria next, or maybe someone from a different game in a different game. 
hit that notification bell if you want to make sure that you're keeping up with my releases. And I'd really appreciate all the support on this video. I worked very hard on it, and I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you guys in the next video, whatever it may be. Peace. I'm not going to